Hello. What you're about to witness is my 2022 live show, Friendly Geordies Presents A Tale As Old As Rome. When I say you're going to view it, you're going to be watching a heavily censored version because there is a lot of stuff there that is too hot for YouTube that we had to uh, cut slash blur for various reasons. You can access the full thing at my Patreon. Sign up, description, and also in the comments. You also get to see a bunch of other stuff because you should just sign up regardless. You get to see videos before they come out. You get to see bonus videos that will never release. And also, there's a bunch of Q&As that you can sign up to depending on your tier. There are a lot of reasons to join that, and I think that you owe me because, look, dude, this costs a lot to film. You owe... Well, I can't really say you owe me. I just, I just like to be recouped. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for the support over the years. Now, please enjoy, I'm guessing about a th two thirds of my last year's stand up show. Because actually, maybe there's not that much to blur out. And well, No, actually, now that I think about it, there is one part that definitely needs to be blurred out. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome Friendly Johnny! Hello, Melbourne. Hello. Good, I'm very good. How are you guys? Uh, so I appreciate you guys coming out and genuinely sincerely. This guy's got a Kevin 07 shirt. All right, yeah, he's, he's here for the right reasons. Thank you. And I appreciate it as well. The reason that I do this show here as well is because obviously, don't you think that Victoria, if this were the movie Aliens, that would be the nest of Labor voters, isn't it? And you just got Daniel Andrews with like a giant, one of those Eureka stockade flags as the thing that lays all you eggs, just being like, yeah, who needs brain stacking when you have this many voters? <laughs> <sighs> so I appreciate it a lot, especially this show. Especially this show, because honestly, this show is my soul. Not to be confused with my essence, that'll be revealed in my up and coming folk jazz album, Man Berean. <laughs> this is everything that's ever resonated with me at my core. Rome, red pills, photos of my ass, it's all gonna be in there tonight. Yeah, that big fan. That's what my soul looks like, by the way, just so you know. You try and fucking murder me. That'll haunt you for the rest of your days. Just before you go to sleep every night, it's gonna whisper in your ear at 9-11 with an inside jar. <laughs> Ever since I was a small boy, well, after I was granted the gift of life, these are my childhood photos, but after that phase... <laughs> I've been obsessed with Rome. Possibly because it was the only material available to me as a boy that could have given me a boner because the child safety was on at our house. And... <laughs> well, that's all you had, right? Wasn't it? It was just either that or the best and less catalogue. Those were your options. <laughs> you know, there was this period... I don't know if you guys got this, but there was this week where the Telegraph, our version of the Herald Sun, was saying, Oh, friendly Geordies caught Gladys Berejikli in a penis snake. Oh, oh, what's a penis snake? Well, if that isn't, what is? <laughs> Tell you another reason that I really like the history of Rome. It's honestly like if the end of Game of Thrones wasn't shit. That's it. That's the history of it. It's just endless clashes of mighty armies, including exotic war machines like elephants. That is so much scarier than tanks. <laughs> if there was war elephants at Tiananmen Square, <laughs> it would have panned out. <laughs> A lot more pancakey. Oh. What does he do in this scenario? <laughs> <laughs> I 
another reason that I really like it is because there's just so many moments in Roman history where the only source, because it was so long ago, you just have one guy for like a hundred years telling you how it was. Just that one. And you just have to accept that they're going to say things like, yeah, Poseidon, king of the ocean, was pissed off he didn't get the right mongoose sacrifice. And so he ordered the entire Roman fleet wrecked and all the survivors are being by penis snakes, obviously. Yeah? <laughs> Which is ridiculous because if that really happened, he'd be wearing a Von Dutch hat. <laughs> Don't you think? Don't you think that that is our version of ancient history. If you're a millennial, you're looking at that being like, oh, I recall that. That occurred under the reign of Cy the Great. <laughs> but I'll give you a good example of what I'm talking about here, right? That's Marcus Aurelius, the philosopher king, one of the greatest emperors of the Golden Age. And he sent his brother and co-emperor, Lucius Verus, to deal with Rome's ancient enemy, Parthia. Now, I've learned that not many people know what Parthia is, but that was the real estate agent of empires back then. <laughs> Honestly, I had to do an introduction video. If they had a national anthem, this would be it. <laughs> Hi, my name's Farouz Patouche from Bow and Arrow Real Estate. Proud choice of real estate for the King of Kings. And it is my absolute pleasure to bring to the market this truly remarkable location of where Afghanistan and shit is. Let's check it out. Recently rezoned, this stunning 2.8 million square kilometre block is brimming with development opportunity, conveniently placed between the Chinese and Roman empires with breathtaking views and fuck all resources of its own. Enjoy the relaxing lifestyle of being a national middleman, collecting trade tariffs from either side without actually offering any service, or, if you like, let out your wild side by doing sneaky, annoying little raids into future Turkey located right next door. Designed with an emphasis on lifestyle in mind, this empire urges you to sit back and shoot arrows from horses in little bullshit skirmishes because you don't want your hair messed up in an actual battle, or you can simply cry like a little bitch and pay tribute if shit doesn't go your way. Hope to see you down here so we can hammer out a treaty that we definitely won't honour. aren't they? No wonder every real estate agent you ever meet in your life is either from that region or a hobbit from the Shire. That's it. There's always some short man in real estate, aren't there? You know, there was this... It was, it was incredible. It was truly remarkable. Like, Lucius did not expect to get that deep into Parthian territory. They weren't expecting to get anywhere close to the capital, but they got there. They sacked it. And because they were so excited in their fervour, they accidentally sacked one of their own god's temples, and that was Apollo, the god of medicine. And you don't want to anger him, because he made sure that Lucius' men came back with the plague. It was called the Antonine Plague. It wiped out a quarter of the empire's population, including Lucius Verus, which, holy fuck. If Apollo was angry at that, can you imagine how fucking pissed off he was when he figured out that these aren't temples? <laughs> Now, naturally, when a quarter of your empire dies, that's a quarter of your taxpayers, a quarter of your soldiers gone, your borders become weak, don't they? And so the Germans started raiding in from the north. And Marcus Aurelius, now the sole surviving emperor, he was forced to take up the sword. And he hated war. There was a reason he was called the Philosopher King. Scott Cam hadn't been born yet. <laughs> What do you think the most philosophical thought that man's ever had is? <laughs> Don't you reckon it was while he was watching some sitcom like Home Improvement on cable? <laughs> yeah, men do leave the toilet seat up, don't they? <laughs> Aurelius was a bookish man. He wanted to spend the rest of his life reforming Rome's legal system because those were the big asks of an emperor back then. Wars, laws, you ask any optometrist, that is extremely difficult to focus on when you don't have pupils. But it, <laughs> well, you're, you're a clever audience, actually. That's pretty, you don't get that response from in Rockhampton when that comes, I can tell you, you don't. They, definitely, they just look at him and just like, yeah, well, he obviously he didn't have eyes. Where's the fucking joke? <laughs> You know that uh, 
It was unfortunate for actually the empire for hundreds of years down the line that he never got to reform the Roman legal system as well. He was just an emergency emperor the entire, m most of his reign. And he spent 12 years fighting on the frontiers of the empire, fighting back wave after wave of barbarian filth. And he was suffering from bone cancer most of the time. So to help him deal with the unimaginable horror that he must have seen on a daily basis, he wrote arguably the world's first self-help book. It was called Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. You know that? <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Holy hell. Jesus, I feel like I'm hosting the book club, except it's not fucking lame and I don't want to change the channel. <laughs> That's incredible. You are extremely learned. That is amazing. Yes, I've read a book that's obscure from 2,000 years ago, of course. <laughs> now, I've never had that response before. But, like, I, I, as you guys would know then, obviously, like, it's a beautiful book, isn't it? It's no. Well, it's good. It's, it's no subtle art of not giving a fuck, is it? <laughs> Don't you think that's the best indicator we have that we're no longer in the golden age? Right there. <laughs> Look at that. They used to be called meditations. Now you couldn't get a self-help book published unless you called it fuckity fuck, fuck balls, ass dick fuck ass. Anyway, this is all just an ad for my self-help channel, Jordan Shanks. You should. Yeah? Yeah! Fans! Look at that, for the one guy in the audience that's just like, I was saying boo worms. There's like one guy. For, for just you though, like make sure that you sign up just before it gets renamed Jordan Shits to fit with the times. <laughs> and then like all self-help channels online inevitably devolves into NFT trading advice. <laughs> where it'll then be renamed Sigma Male Gains. <laughs> Anyway, it was while Aurelius was fighting a particularly ferocious enemy known as the Quaddy. <laughs> oh, what? Well, I'm sorry, you can't airbrush history, okay? <laughs> they surrounded Aurelius' fortification and cut off the water supply because they're the ancestors of the National Party, apparently. <laughs> oh, thank you. And they started scaling the walls. This was the end, and Marcus Aurelius knew why. So he grabbed his Egyptian priest, ran to the walls, dropped to his knees and screamed at the heavens, I'm sorry my brother sacked your temple, Apollo! Forgive me! And at that moment, a thunderstorm appeared out of nowhere. It started pouring rain. The men upturned their helmets and shields to drink this literal martyr from heaven, while the lightning Attracted to the Quaddy's wheelchair. <laughs> Forced him back into the forest. That's why ancient's better than modern. That's why when I told my friends that, they said, well. <laughs> that, uh, that never happened, did it? <laughs> yes, it happened! Look! There it is, etched into history forever. That is Marcus Aurelius' spiral of triumph. There's the men drinking the rain. There's the old man water spirit that helped them out. The story checks out. They did a restoration on him a few years back. He was wearing a Von Dutch hat. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. There'll be just four more references to Von Dutch this show. So make sure that you... Uh, Tune in for that. But the reason that I uh, put that epic tale in there is to just illustrate that that was just one of thousands. When I was a boy, there was a lot of Lego involved. <laughs> the only child's attempt at building a brother. But 
But I used to also feel like the kid in the never-ending story with these stories, right? I used to celebrate Rome's triumphs and lament her losses and it was always accompanied with this beautiful melancholy which I can't really describe to modern audiences. The closest thing that I've come to is, you know when you're watching an anime, yeah? <laughs> that man knows. <laughs> always one tucked in the corner in the darkness. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that. <laughs> At least he's honest. I could see there's many anime fans in the audience. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but you know, you know that you know that moment. Like everyone's watched Pokemon or whatever, but you know, there's that moment in every anime where it just gets a bit too Japanese. <laughs> you know. Yeah, that moment, like, yeah, there's always just like, I don't know, it's some chick playing around with an alien squirrel and you're thinking, what the fuck? <laughs> then it suddenly hits you, oh, it's yet another metaphor for Hiroshima, right? <laughs> well, it is every time. You could even ask Miyazaki, hmm, an explosive theory. <laughs> I mean, Team Rocket blasting off again. <laughs> Why? Why? <laughs> what is that just like? So that's how they had the energy to propel that far so they looked like stars at the end. The ding. <laughs> I finally get it. <laughs> huh? Jesse and James. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, everyone knew that, didn't they? Jesus, like, okay, that was, yeah, that was not the same response as Marcus Aurelius. I just realised, like, how highbrow this audience is. <laughs> They're just like, mm, Pokemon, but how can a shoe be an animal? But... <laughs> you know, there was this, uh... <laughs> I don't know, there was just a point, I can't remember exactly where it was, but I just got... I don't know, I just uh, you know, got other interests in life, let's just say. Obviously, media bias became my adult obsession. And it was while I was reading Parenti's brilliant book on the subject, I highly recommended Inventing Reality, that I came across his other seminal work, The Assassination of Julius Caesar. And that, yeah, that was his ass on me. Don't you know it? Because this, this, like, for me personally, that was my two inner worlds unexpectedly colliding and forcing me to think for the first time. You know that phrase, history's written by the victors? No. Well, okay, well, thank you for speaking on behalf of everyone with that very definite no. <laughs> no, move on. <laughs> I polled them specifically on that. <laughs> but, like... Most people have heard that, that history is written by the... And I think it is somewhat accurate. But thanks to my own experience with the press, I think it should be retooled a little bit. If I was making that phrase, you know what I'd make it? History is written by the losers of the victors. Because <laughs> think about it. Who else could have written it, right? Winners were too busy winning. Working class was too busy working. It was always written by some golem like Michael Coziel at the Sydney Morning Herald. <laughs> Look at him. Look at him! <laughs> Madam, is the first thought when you look at him, wow, now there's a self-made man with a lot of friends. <laughs> there is no way that genetic mistake <laughs> could have survived even a few generations ago at a working class family. Foot of a mountain, straight away, right? <laughs> Now, this is important. I need you to remember this for the rest of your lives. The upper class equivalent of those that can't do teach is those that are too shit to become CEOs become journalists. <laughs> CEOs are your cream of the crop. Journalists are your two litres Coles milk. Which makes historians out of date milk, doesn't it? 
is the same person. After all, what is today's newspaper other than tomorrow's archive? Okay, well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Continue. I wasn't going to, I was just about to be like, oh, that's never happened before. <laughs> Thank you for your strength. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, well, look, you're not the only one, though. Like, no one's impressed by that line. <laughs> I always thought it was witty as, and then every audience ever's just kind of just like, shut up, and then just <laughs> move on. So I have to win the audience back, I've realised, with this next slide. You ready to be wowed? <laughs> yeah. Sophie Monkey. <laughs> Every, yes. Thank you. Thank you. That's where your money's going. I'm going to be genetically splicing that animal into reality so I have two streams of passive income. <laughs> One for when she hosts Love Island. And I'm just going to keep her in Bali for the rest of the year so she can steal sunglasses off of tourists. <laughs> I suppose what I'm trying to say is that all of history and journalism is always seen through those sad SpongeBob SquarePants glasses frames. <laughs> that is the blue checks uniform. It's such a good emblem of them because it's these are always the same type of people that all throughout history have always got to determine what is and isn't reality. It is the offcuts of the upper crust. And that's why a lot of history is really boring because it's the same type of person looking at it through the same lens all the way down. And now that same type of person, you can see how unoriginal they are in thinking. Every time, if a blue check journalist doesn't like you, they're always going to say something like, oh, Friendly Geordies is the next uh, Mark Latham. <laughs> yeah? I don't know if I'd be accusing myself of owning sex slaves. <laughs> he did that. That man was almost Prime Minister. He said, you have sex slaves. I was like, give me some credit. If I was going to have sex slaves, I'd go to some PR department if I was going to announce it and come up with something jazzy like, they're not sex slaves, they're slaves with benefits. <laughs> But if they don't like you, if they don't like you, they're always going to give you one of those labels every time. They're always going to be, oh, you're like Mark Latham or that chick from I Love Lucy. <laughs> or if you're really bad, if you're worse than Genghis Khan, worse than Vlad the Impaler, worse than Chris Tucker, well, wouldn't you pay any money to see this film? Chris Tucker is Joseph Stalin. <laughs> Premier, the five-year plan is behind by two years. Damn, that's fucked up. <laughs> it's Trump, isn't it? Trump is the boogeyman du jour of the commentariat. If you're compared to Trump, you're responsible for all the world's ills, and yet there is one who trumps Trump. Caesar? Isn't that... Yes, Caesar, well done. <laughs> what the hell is that? I specifically said, no, I don't want one of those, like, blind interpreters in this. <laughs> <laughs> what? No, if you don't have eyes, it's because God doesn't like you, okay? Now, you deal with that. And the rest of us are going to heaven and we're going to have a good day. <laughs> isn't that incredible, though? Like, isn't that incredible? It's that, so incredible. It's like, everyone bad ever is like Trump. And yet, Trump is like Caesar. What the fuck did that man do 
to attract the ire of the ruling class for the last 2,000 years and counting. And I can see them already. My other arch nemesis that strangely come to my shows, Reddit users. <laughs> Body odour that would cause the Sphinx to pass out. <laughs> Itching to say, this is an extremely shitty take. <laughs> Didn't you know that Julius Caesar committed a genocide. <laughs> well, you just saved the show 10 minutes. That's pretty cool. You're just <laughs> wowing that. Don't you think? Because, like, dude, it was the style at the time. <laughs> Three to go. Three to go. <laughs> it was the ancient world. What, do you think because the Gauls looked ex exactly like your barista, they were just as chill? <laughs> I don't think they had mochaccinos. I think the way Gauls got up in the morning was by a fellow soldier pissing on their heads. Which is exactly what our generation needed to toughen us up. <laughs> Imagine that. Your dad. First thing in the morning. <laughs> right in the eyes. And the fact that it's warm for a little bit acts as a snooze alarm. This is going to freak you out. This is going to be like learning that the face on Mars is actually... <laughs> the Gauls were not peace-loving hippies. They were more like Charlie Manson hippies. They both hated the Romans, right? Ooh. I'm, I'm, I'm all right. I'm glad that got a, I actually, you know, to be honest, I actually do think that's the cleverest thing I'll ever come up with in my life. I think, thank you, because that, that took effort. It took effort. I was mulling on how to like tie that bit up for a long time and it was one of those shower thoughts where you're just like, oh, Eureka. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, I'm gonna be saying ghoul a bit, for the, so I'm just trying to introduce what it is, because everyone's like, what the fuck is ghoul? Gaul's pretty much just modern day France. There's like other bits to it, but it's pretty much just that. And Gaul was constantly attacking the Italian peninsula. They even sacked Rome herself once. And when I say they, I mean one of their many, many tribes. Gaul was still a bit safer than Broad Meadows, but... <laughs> it was still a terrible place to live. You know that like a lot of these tribes sided with the Romans because they were far more scared of their northern neighbours, the Germans. And fair enough. Germans are scary enough now with their 24-hour nightclubs. 24 hours. They need DJs as much as you need McNuggets. <laughs> Did you know that when the Roman Empire collapsed, the population of Europe went from 75 million to 25 million? And those that would survive the fall would envy the dead. Because as bone samples show, if you were alive for a thousand years after the collapse, you were a malnourished, anorexic hobbit. This is an artist's impression of what they think people must have looked like back then. <laughs> it's mostly because the trade routes collapsed. Right? It's hard to get grain from Egypt to Spain if you are constantly being attacked by pirates who had their own independent food source. It wasn't fraught without its own problems. You know that a lot of pirate patches were from them fishing, being like, yeah, this one be a wily one. Yeah! <laughs> you 
you uh, probably haven't heard this phrase, but it's actually, I like it a lot. Uh, it's that if you want to see how advanced a civilization is, you should check its library. This is why Darwin's so fucking stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Biggest libraries. Biggest libraries in the Dark Ages? Maybe 500 books. Maybe. And most of those books would have been about God, so it was essentially the family library of that homeschooled kid you randomly met in year seven. Do you, do you remember that? Do you remember that? Isn't that incredible? Like, no matter where you go in this country, there's always like a few people just tilting their heads. I did meet a homeschooled kid. <laughs> Before their head realigns as they realise, no, that's right, I was watching Have You Been Paying Attention and thought surely Ed Cavalli was homeschooled. <laughs> Doesn't he? Like, that man has never left his house without sunscreen and a rape whistle. Not once. <laughs> Not once. You know, I met a homeschool kid after a show once. Well, he was an adult, but... <laughs> Just some ten-year-old comes up to me. Oh, yeah? And no one knows you're here, eh? He's an adult. <laughs> and he comes up, comes up, tells me he's homeschooled. I'm like, yeah, yeah, why the fuck did you come? Isn't this... <laughs> well, you know, you know, isn't this exactly what you would imagine a homeschool kid would say to that? Quote, I came here to learn about the world. It's like you didn't miss out on much. The only thing anyone remembers from high school, do you guys have this memory? Your woodwork teacher raising a hand with a missing finger. <laughs> yeah. In order to illustrate the point, make sure you hold the wood away from the saw. If you hold it too close, He'll get you. <laughs> Why does that guy look so confused? <laughs> it's like trying to figure it out. Just like, uh, but like, how did it get there? Is there an aquarium underneath the saw? <laughs> Don't think about it too deeply. <laughs> Biggest libraries in the Roman era were a little bit bigger than 500 books. They were 500,000. Is that it? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, thanks, thanks. You realise we are recording this show, right? <laughs> Over the top commentary with this blind interpreter that also has sass. You know, like, Audible has 200,000 books, just to put that in perspective, right? Sorry. So, how? <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> just kiss you. I'm an internet comic in real life. <laughs> but think about how educated that civilization must have been, right? That means... You know what that means? Like, it means, like, think about this. There was graffiti on low-tier brothels, not even high-end ones, low-tier brothels saying things like, Siliqua's a great fuck. <laughs> you know what that means? Tradies were literate. <laughs> Tradies aren't literate now. They go from job to job with a bunch of meat pie crumbs from their car to the house they're working on. <laughs> and if a dog comes along and licks it up, oh no, I lost the scent! <laughs> you know, I, uh, when I was doing this for the first time, because it was the test run, right? You do a couple of shows and you figure out what's working and what's not. 
And so you're getting feedback from the audience at the end. And this massive tradie comes up, like he was a roider, right? Like he was huge, he was an intimidating man. He goes, that tradie joke was fucking appalling, mate. And if I knew how to write, I'd write a letter of complaint. <laughs> Warfare technology and action, uh, that's not that interesting. We'll just move on to the much more fascinating topic of pottery as an economic metric. Yeah. You're a fan? You like that? <laughs> Ceramics enthusiast. Yeah, there we go. There we go. It's a good, I'm telling you, it is, because look at this. Look at this. Look at that. That is Roman pottery now. That's how well preserved it is. So we know exactly how prosperous a time was by how much of it is in what quantities where. Yeah, it's kind of like the soda stream of today. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if you guys got this, because I don't know what lockdown was like in Victoria. In fact, no one does. <laughs> but, but... <laughs> but, uh... This always rung true in New South Wales when you'd say it to that audience because they'd know exactly what that meant. You didn't need graphs showing you that we were going into an economic slump. All you needed to know that in 2019, that was a perfect Christmas gift. 2020, the only way you could get one was to go to the back of a Harvey Norman with your mask on like it was a medieval tower turret. What's your business here? <laughs> I come seeking bubbly water, sire. <laughs> Bubbly water. Tis a myth it is. Like dragons and triple J rappers that aren't gingers. <laughs> but look at this. It blows my mind. We have beautifully crafted plates, jars, Mr. and Mrs. Grassheads. <laughs> Manufactured in huge factories in Africa. It's hard to tell you how big these were, but they needed a continual stream of barges constantly entering Europe day and night. These barges were massive. We would not see ships the size of that again until the Dutch East India Trade Company. Thank you. Thank you. Two to go. Two to go. I was proud of that one. Thank you. They've been be dispersed amongst an extremely complicated network of traders and merchants that was only possible because of an extremely sophisticated bureaucracy. I'm talking we would not see a bureaucracy like that again until the 19th century. And that bureaucracy with that complex trading system saw these wares from Africa reach the darkest corners of the empire in vast, vast quantities. So wrap your head around this. The poorest of the poor in Britain would be eating off of high-quality, factory-made African plates, living in houses made of high-quality, factory-made Italian brick. In the dark ages, they'd be living in houses that there was literally a fairy tale warning you not to build houses out of. <laughs> they lasted 30 years. Huge improvement on mastered and home, sure. <laughs> That is a Roman house, built for the poor. It still stands today. You could do a couple of alterations to that and live in it today. And I know that all the middle-aged women in here are thinking, oh, and I would live there. I love Italy. While all the Indian doctors are thinking, can you go back to the mustard and home? Now, because there's no difference between BuzzFeed journalists and historians these days, look at this c <laughs> Look at him. They've written dozens of articles just being like, it's actually very racist to say that Rome was a superior civilization because those institutions outlasted the empire. He's talking about that trade route, by the way, which is so dishonest. It existed in some capacity, sure, for maybe 100 years after. It rapidly shrank from all of Europe to just Rome. The amount of plates being produced in Africa went from tens of millions to a few dozen. And you know who they think owned those few dozen plates? The Pope. Yeah. 
It took divine intervention in the Dark Ages to afford a basic quality of Roman life. Meaning everyone else? You know that piece of shit plate you made for your mum when you were four? <laughs> you know that? And she humoured you with the whole, oh, that's too special to eat off. Thank you. <laughs> if medieval peasants could time travel, tss, not for me! But if I could impress upon you just how impressive Roman civilization was in a single stat, this would be it. Rome was the first city on earth to reach a population of over a million. That is so impressive given the technology that they had. But when I add this in, it's going to be like the first time that you learn that every Korean woman that goes through menopause gets a free clown wig chucked in for nothing. <laughs> The next city to reach that size in Europe was London in 1810. It took the invention of the steam engine to get civilization back to that just a mere 1,800 years later. And yet I see all these people online, oh, where do you think Atlantis is? I think that was it. I think that was like living now, except instead of having an iPhone, you had a stomach full of parasites. And that was cool, that tapeworm meant you had a tape measure wherever you went. No wonder they were so good at building houses. <laughs> but you know, that, uh, you know that movie, The Road? Have you seen that? Fuck, what a great audience, I really like that. I've read Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. What's that, a movie from my time? It's not in black and white, I'm not. That's awesome. Look, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's just a post-apocalyptic film, right? Yeah, it's a good film, it is. It's basically just a preview if Matthew Guy wins the next election, but. but <laughs> Look at that underinvestment in infrastructure. <laughs> but it's pretty much just that, right? Like that would have been like living after the Roman Empire collapse. You would have been wandering through broken, cracked streets, hungry and scared your entire short life, while all these great statues that had toppled over are just staring at you from a golden age knowingly, mockingly, just laughing at you. <laughs> <sighs> Can you help me up? <laughs> and I know that last point goes on for a little bit too long, but I had to just keep adding to it because after most shows, at the beginning of this, it'd always just be a bunch of first year uni students coming up being like, you don't understand. He killed a million people, which again, isn't even close to accurate, but I'll give it to you. What about the 50 million that died after the half millennium of stability created by that man's line there? Most of the serious military conflict from then on was along this naturally defendable border, defended by the very people that Caesar had subjugated for centuries because of what Rome gave to them. In other words, Caesar created the Pax Romana. It was the Roman peace. It was the longest stretch of prosperity in European history by a mile. And had he been allowed to live, what he was about to do would have dwarfed that. And the only reason I had to put that all in there is to say, first year uni students, Caesar's better than you. Okay? Hitler's better than you. He is. Well, could you invade Poland? No? Then shut the fuck up! <laughs> I tell you, it's even more uh, brutal than Hitler anyway, Facebook group chat. <laughs> what do you think? I mean, how many broken dreams are a result of that? <laughs> My dreams were almost broken. 
I was looking, I went back to see the first time my friends found out about friendly Geordies. I didn't tell them. They just went on like, these are screenshots of what happened. It was the first time they ever discovered it, a link with the words, ha, 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 ha. Now, at that point, I was cautiously optimistic. I was thinking, are they laughing with me? Are they laughing at me? Thankfully, that was clarified very quickly with, this sucks. <laughs> Nathan decided to elaborate on that with, don't you reckon it would be less embarrassing if this was just footage of Jordan when he asked Megan out and got rejected? <laughs> And the next one, uh, I don't even care that it's about me. It's just, you know when someone like gets you so hard that you think, fuck, that belongs in a museum. <laughs> I, mean, I just want this immortalized because it's just such a good burn. It was written by the guy that I nicknamed Fat Goth in my skits. Maybe him, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at what a wordsmith Fat Goth is. Look at this. You know how my father died in the same week my fiance left me for another man? The only thing that prevented me from killing myself was the thought that at least I'm not Jordan. It still hurts. There's this brilliant book, it's called The Politics of Genocide. It was written by Larry David, I think. <laughs> What it's based off, and this is very crucial, crucial stuff. What it's based off is the concept of genocide. The idea that's our time's cardinal sin. Our time's. Exactly, when Caesar started being guilty of it, isn't that a coincidence? And in the last 2,000 years, Caesar has been guilty of whatever the moral outrage was at exactly the time it was. In the Enlightenment era, he was an enemy of liberty. In the Victorian era, he was debauched. In the early 2000s, it was related to Phil Collins, and that one is a crime. That's terrible. <laughs> it's so bad, isn't it? Look, I can't tell if his daughter's the hottest woman on earth or a kebab shop owner, can you? It's the eyebrows. I used to have a gag to that, but I can't remember. I can't remember which of these two is photoshopped. <laughs> what I'm saying is, each generation of the c classes has added their own unique layer of moralizing dirt to chuck on Caesar's spirit. Through time, those lies become accepted truth. Sort of like how we used to think the bunyips existed in Australia and then we got photographic enhancing technology. It was just Nicole Flint in the bushes. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> Remember that? I'm making a salient political point. <laughs> yeah, because you just look like a fucking homeless woman to me. <laughs> If you want to be taken seriously, maybe you should dress seriously. Maybe you should wear Kmart. <laughs> and you should make sure that the air conditioning is OFF WHEN YOU DO IT! <laughs> if you'd like some further reading, uh, this article, unintentionally, just sums up what the last 2,000 lies, 2,000 years of lies were. It's, it's really, it looks like, you know, obviously just being like, Caesar was bad for this reason and this reason. It's great. There's one sentence, it's like an archaeological soil sample, if you will, and if you won't, there's the door. I hope that when you leave, who does count? <laughs> It was really weird. I was walking down Melbourne yesterday and like these lads came up to me and were like, why do you hate Spanion, bro? Why do you hate Spanion? I was like, I don't hate Spanion, I hate you. I didn't say that. I was just like, oh, I don't know. He's this cool guy. <laughs> Let's read this together. Look, look at this. The Donald Trump of his day. Oh, good start. Julius Caesar promised to return Rome to an imagined ancient glory, but instead constructed himself a throne. 
bulldozing democratic norms, ignoring checks on his power and eroding political debate. Eroding political debate. You know Cicero? Yeah. Uh, what? Yeah, of course you would. Yeah, sorry. And I, honestly, because like most audiences when I'm just like, you know Cicero, they're always like, uh, uh, the guy from Skyrim. <laughs> but just in case you don't know, um, he, was, he, was, he was very famous at his time. He was famous all throughout history, really. He was a, a master orator of his time. He was incredible, and he is. He's extremely witty. I guess kind of like an Oscar Wilde if he was a boss barrister and a senator. He was an extremely accomplished man. Uh, and he was also just known as the greatest debater of his time. Sort of like how Avi Yemeni is the greatest debater of our time. <laughs> Can we all just acknowledge for a second that that might be one of the most successful entrepreneurs of our generation? and his product is trying to get maced in the face. <laughs> That's progress, isn't it? Because like a hundred years ago, who would have been successful? I don't know, some enterprising factory worker. A few hundred years before that, it would have been a particularly productive farmer. Now the product is yes, harvest has come in early and it's capsicum. Cicero thought Caesar was a better debater than him. Why would you shut something down that you're that good at? That is like that kid at your school who what he lacked in social skills he made up for in card tricks one day deciding, hey, I don't need these card tricks. I can just be myself. <laughs> oh no, you can't. <laughs> That's what you get for having an overbearing mother that didn't allow you to develop a personality. You have to become the high school equivalent of a busker, except instead of busking for money, you're busking for attention. No one immediately springs to mind, but you know, Marlins. <laughs> yeah. You know, Marius. Marius was sort of like the Windows 95 version of Caesar. He was trying to do what Caesar was doing but a generation before. And something always sticks in my head about him. He tried to open up a debating academy for the poor so they at least had the ability to properly articulate their case. Because it was just it was so important back then to be a good debater. It was like maths now. And so all of the accomplished families would have been teaching their children the art of debate since birth with a Greek slave that they would have purchased and shipped over whose entire job was just to teach them the art of rhetoric. Kind of like how I'm sure Ben Shapiro has one hiding in his closet today. <laughs> there you did. There you did. Just, just before he goes on air. Do you need me to help you own the libtards again, Benny? <laughs> Shh, we're about to go live. Here, have some halloumi. You're too kind to me, Benny. <laughs> now, after a while, the Senate got sick of Marius winning every election that he ever went to, and so they installed their own dictator. His name was Sulla, and after Sulla wiped out tens of thousands of Marius' supporters, which, again, wasn't bulldozing democratic norms, that was just restoring the republic to its foundations, of course. After that, he shut down the debating academy. And then, when Caesar took up the reins, he reopened that debating academy for the poor, and after the Senate stabbed him 23 times, which again wasn't shutting down debate, that was just a very pointed retort, <laughs> they shut down the debating academy again. They didn't even want the poor to have the ability to communicate. And yet shutting down debate to that level wasn't shutting down debate. Nor was the previous hundred years of deliberate political assassinations of any prominent politician that tried to prosecute the case of the poor. I'm talking about the Gracchi brothers, Catalina Cadillac. 
I know that one's a bit of a fizzy. You know why I keep it in, though? It's because my editor was like, that is the worst Photoshop I've ever done in my life. <laughs> Can you take it out? To which I said, no! Blow it up! Show the people your fine work! Because look at this, I want you to pay extra. Look at that, the light isn't even on his eye. It's so crap. <laughs> you know how these, th these were prominent men. These were very powerful, well-known men. And in the middle of the day, most of the time, the Senate would just hire a bunch of gladiators to come to their doorstep and just kill them in broad daylight. It was fucking br like how terrifying would that be? It'd be scary enough if it was the tigers. <laughs> With their trained ability of giving you the dreaded rear admiral. <laughs> <laughs> what if that was a spear? <laughs> uh, truth be told. That's actually the only reason I was reticent on filming my special in Melbourne. Because I knew that you guys wouldn't know who that is. So allow me to educate you on who John Hopper Wate the Great was, right? John Hopper Wate, it's incredible. John Hopper Wate. He was okay at NRL. He was pretty good. He wasn't great. But he was paid a million dollars a year because he was good at going, surprise bro. That was his skill. <laughs> his economic productivity was that he was good at fingering other men <laughs> in very specific circumstances <laughs> and he's richer than you'll ever be in your life. No, no. My friend saw him walking down the street. This was maybe 10 years after he'd left the league. And he goes, oh, no way. John Hopperwade, can I get a photo? He goes, sure thing, bro. And poses like this. <laughs> but none of those political assassinations over a hundred year span, none of it, none of that was bulldozing democratic norms, even to modern historians today, 95% of them. You know what is bulldozing democratic norms to this day according to historians? Caesar undergoing the largest democratic expansion in the Republic's history. Not only did he reinstate the powers of the People's Assembly in Rome that had been shut down under Sulla, that was kind of like a rudimentary lower house, I suppose. Actually, it's kind of more democratic than a lower house now, but he also reinstalled the powers of the People's Assembly in Greece. Those have been shut down for a hundred years. He expanded senatorial membership to include Gaulish and Spanish chieftains because he was such a racist, genocidal maniac, of course. And this is the big one. This is how you know he was on the level, because he expanded the powers of the building block of every democracy in history, which are, of course, unions which back then were called guilds. How much do you wish they were still called guilds? <laughs> Don't you? Wouldn't you rather join a guild than a union? 100%. Absolutely. Like, think about how big the membership of the hospitality union would be if they renamed to the Guild of Bar Wenches. <laughs> Wouldn't that? Wouldn't you join that? I think the CFMEU would still be called the CFMEU, even back then, and I think John Secker would still be running it in 50 BC. <laughs> Fighting for an extra onion a week. <laughs> it would have sucked being poor in 50 BC, wouldn't it? Imagine that. Like, it, it sucks being poor now, but now you've got meth to pass the time. <laughs> How did you alter your consciousness back then? Just put the onion near your eye and hope for the best. That was it. That's all you had. You know, <laughs> you know, for like, uh, I, was in, I, was, uh, I, was, I was in the meth capital, I found out later, which was Adelaide, right? Like, apparently that's the biggest. 
every night, five nights in a row, 400 pairs of eyes staring at me blankly, nothing, got absolutely nothing. Yeah, and then, and then on the last night, I was staring into their glassy eyes and I realised it's because they're saying back at me, yeah, meth is better than that. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried both. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, like, I don't agree with much that Cicero said. Uh, but it, it was also kind of cool because... It was on the other side of politics, yeah, but back then they were extremely honest about what their position was. Like, you know exactly what Cicero thought because he just wrote so much about his political positions which pretty much were just like, fuck, I hate poor people. That was it. <laughs> which was cool, right? Like, I, at least they were honest about it. I'd actually vote for him. I'd just be like, yeah, fuck me, I am scum, you know? Like, I, I, <laughs> I like the fact that they you know? It's the same reason why I never want to get rid of the monarchy. I like the thing that someone's just been like, no, nah, we're appointed by God, we're taking your tax money, fuck you. I like that. <laughs> I like it, right? And so, it's just like a, a flavour, yeah? But there is one thing that I always... Uh, it, it struck me. Because he had these incredible insights into the parliamentary system. And one of them was... And it's so true. All throughout history, in every parliamentary system, you know how everyone's always like, oh, it's a two-party system, which it isn't. It's just that there are two general interest groups in every civilization ever, which are the haves and the have-nots. That's it. So every parliament ever just breaks into those two blocks. Sometimes you get your little temper tantrum parties like the Greens and the DLP, but they always come back to the fold. And you know why they do that? It's because, really, once the jig is up, there's only two ways to get elected to parliament ever. You can appeal to the masses or the asses. That's it. <laughs> Except in Uganda, you can perform some kind of Michael Jackson martial art. <laughs> 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 One more time. One more time. Hey, someone, you, you do the Michael Jackson sounds. Ready? Wait, wait, go, go, go now. <laughs> Yeah, 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 go, go, go. Yes! Oh my god, she did it! Yeah, 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 she deserved it. That was awesome. That was sick. <laughs> Why did he do that? <laughs> but uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll introduce you. Uh, to, to, to the, the Labour Party of the day. They were called the Populares. And now I'm not going to try and correctly pronounce these words like Kate from the 3 pm pickup. She's always doing that. Oh, I lived in Italy for a year. Yeah, well, I lived in Marrickville in Sydney for a year. There's more fucking wogs there than there is in Europe, okay? There <laughs> is. Like, dude, you know, I was there when I was 12 in Marrickville. I was on a bus. I look out, it's a main street. Look out, and there's just an old Greek man pissing in the gutter. <laughs> it's like, I wish I had that confidence. You have to be fairly confident in this job. A lot of this show is me trying to convince you that Pol Pot was one of the greatest leaders of the 20th century. <laughs> I don't think I could take it to the next level of being like, oh, and Pol Pot was um, better than your dad as well. And... Excuse me for a second, I just <laughs> need to go and... Oh. 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 <laughs> I can't go in front of all these people. <laughs> I'm shy. I'm gonna keep that in my pants for three quarters of the show. Look at that, how sweaty is it? You know? <laughs> I love that first 10 seconds when you whip this out and you can feel the audience being like, ooh, he's done it, he's gone too far. <laughs> Can't help myself, that, that's just a classic gag, isn't it, right there? That is the oldest joke in human history. The first time someone made a gag, it would have been some caveman going, Arr! 
all these eight men. <laughs> You gotta help me with something, you ready? I can't tell the difference between that penis and Michael Clinn. <laughs> look, look at this, isn't it uncanny? <laughs> a champion swimmer that looked like a cock. No wonder he won the world's greatest race. <laughs> You know, I've done this show probably a hundred times at this point and I still don't know how to transition back to like, um, so anyway, back to the popular race of ancient. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Done. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Popular race, listen to this. Popular race. Root word for populist. You should see the faces of people on CNN and the drum when they utter the word populist. It is like Malcolm Turnbull entering a house that doesn't have a scullery maid. <laughs> Pure contempt. <laughs> what are they saying? This is, what their, this is what their mannerisms are saying when they say that. They're essentially saying, how dare this politician represent the interests of the public? How dare they? Root word. For the original block that represented the have-nots. It is now synonymous with charlatan, demagogue, it essentially means a problem politician that needs to be dealt with. Do you see how deep this goes? Do you see the elephant in this magic eye? <laughs> Surprise, Stooge. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to make the cut of the video, but uh, I'm going to introduce you now to uh, the Liberal Party of the day. They were called the Optimates. How next level is this? You know what Optimates meant? The best ones. <laughs> How many generations of getting carted around by four hot naked men before you started thinking, I know, let's call ourselves the everyone shitter than us party. <laughs> Yes. Let's give ourselves the same name DJ Carlet gave his record label. That's approachable. <laughs> DJ Carlet. <laughs> Which, speaking of cracks, let's go <laughs> even deeper. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Look at his little Michael Jackson glove. Three fingers. <laughs> Came prepared, just be like, that's my business hand. <laughs> <sighs> Why do you think this man came to the conclusion that eroding political debate is one of these big Western no-nos that you're not allowed to touch. Do you think he came to that conclusion? I've listened to that man's podcast. I can tell you right now, the only conclusion that man's ever come to in his life is his marriage. <laughs> is that friendly Geordie's on stage or a cat? Right here. <laughs> You want it again, all right, okay, yeah, we'll do it again, we'll do it again. <laughs> want to hear something really catty for Melbourne? I like Geelong better. Right here. <laughs> I would posit that the reason that man came to that conclusion is because these fine gentlemen came to the conclusion that debate is this big treasured western no-no that you're not allowed to touch. And why would that? I honestly think it's because debate delays action. 
Think about it. Climate change, asbestos. Who's hotter, Timothy Charlemagne or Scott Morrison? We'll never know. <laughs> Scott Morrison. <laughs> well, I say, yeah, it's because of his winning smile. <laughs> now, you mean, just, just look at his mouth for a second. Don't you think every time you look at his mouth, you're always just like, yeah, he knows how to suck a cock. <laughs> If I had a time machine, I'd figure out if Silica was a great fuck. That's the first stop. <laughs> I'd do it for you! Because think about this, like, as a YouTuber, all you're ever thinking about is thumbs, thumbs and titles, thumbs and titles. That's all you're ever, just trying to get you to just be like, all right, you got me, and click on you, right? And uh, honestly, as, uh, just a quick poll, would you be able to resist clicking on a video entitled, I got a time machine to fuck an ancient prostitute? <laughs> But you kind of can go back in time. You can, because you can just read what the Optimates and Populares were arguing about back then, and it is uncanny. What the Optimates were arguing about is exactly what the Liberal Party argue about today. Freedom this, liberty that, until freedom and liberty start encroaching on their financial interests, in which case they order a crackdown on freedom and liberty, of course. And maybe, maybe that's a coincidence. Or maybe it's that if you take away all of the labels that I'm always trying to take away from politics, like left, right, progressive, conservative, you get rid of whatever the trendy word is of the time, you get rid of the argy-bargy back and forth of like, Mr. Speaker, he's not going to standing order, he should, you know, like get rid of all of that. You know what you're left with? You are left with 2,000 years of the exact same pattern. You have one of those two blocks, the permanent blocks of parliamentary systems. One block arguing for one very simple thing all throughout history, which is to protect and expand private assets that should clearly be public assets. That's it. 2,000 years. Same argument. Uh, well, thanks, man. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't expect to clap, but all right, I'll take it. You know what those interest groups were that the Optimates were protecting back then? It's uncanny. It's uh, no? Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> I actually give people 20 bucks if they answer correctly. And like, it never, it's like four times that I've ever had to give it back. And so I always just give it to like a homeless person afterwards. It was just because I was like, one day I was just walking past like a bag lady in Sydney and I was like, fuck, it's fucking Nikki Webster. Oh my, David, she's just got that face now, doesn't she? Like, excuse me, love, have you got too much? Um, I love that response from the audience. I'm like, not our Nikki. Ager <laughs> publicus meant public land. The land around Rome was public. You could hire it from, you know about this? You'd hire it from the treasury at 300 acre lots. That was a beautiful system because it meant that there was a continual stream of income entering the treasury. There was a continual stream of food entering the capital. And this is the big one. It just, it, it allowed the plebeian class to sustain their own lives. Three benefits. I call it the hooli doolies effect. <laughs> it's hooli dooly. When you're an adult and you look at them, you think one of you was a recovering heroin addict, don't you? <laughs> And my guess is on the one wearing a long sleeve shirt on a tropical island. <laughs> but then through time, the elite class decided, actually, I want that land for my estate. And so they started kicking these people off using the extremely persuasive argument of a man holding a trident and a net. Which I, I never got that. Why would you be scared of him unless you're a mermaid? If he's the reason the mermaids are extinct, I'm going to be very upset. Because <laughs> if they were alive today, they'd be an endangered species, wouldn't they? 200 left. Half of them choke on plastic. Sometimes their numbers get a little too high. We have to cull them. <laughs> and in the 1700s, that was a fair fight because they could use their siren songs to lull the sailors to a watery grave. But now we've got noise-cancelling headphones. <laughs> just listening to a podcast ad about beard oil as you electrocute 30 of them. <laughs> I 
I wish that was the future of mermaids. <laughs> and they existed. Just going to have to trawl the streets looking for any children watching the little mermaid so I can press my face up against the glass and watch with them. <laughs> Sometimes their parents come out. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> Shh. Ariel's talking. Anyway, after that, uh, the plebeian class would have nowhere to go, so they'd just go onto the streets of Rome where they would fall prey to the second interest group that the Optimates were protecting back then, which were slumlords. Does that remind you of anyone? A group of mega farmers in a convenient alliance with a bunch of property moguls that even back then included hero to the glasses everywhere. They all love Cicero. They're, oh, he's so witty and smart. And it's like, yeah, he was. But then they say things like, oh, but Caesar was like Trump. Go back and read a bit about this man's life. It is very obvious who'd be flying around in the private jet eating McDonald's today. We have, we have this. This is incredible. It's, it's such a relevant piece of paper today. It is one of his letters where he says, two of my apartments collapsed on the weekend. Apartments in ancient Rome used to collapse all the time because they didn't have building codes. They knew what building codes were. The populares were always trying to pass these building codes and they were always blocked by the optimates because they were the ones that owned these buildings and they didn't want to pay for the upgrades. And so they used to collapse and catch on fire all the time. And so much so that it's like a minor annoyance to Cicero. You can tell. He definitely doesn't give a shit about the people that would have died in the rubble. He doesn't care about that at all. But he does finish the letter with something very telling, which is, but not to worry because the Senate is about to pass a law. Oh, to stop that from happening in the future? No, to compensate me for my losses. <laughs> they use the money of the people in the rubble to incentivize more buildings catching on fire and collapsing. What a difference 2,000 years makes, eh? Right. These are the so-called concerned fathers of the late Republic, including the noblest Roman of them all, according to Shakespeare, Brutus, who used to charge, you ready for this? 49% interest. 49%. Wouldn't that give the nimble bunny a stiffy? <laughs> Forty-nine percent. There is no way these people could have paid that back. They couldn't pay back twenty percent. The point of encumbering them with that much debt was that at some point they would have to sell themselves and their families into slavery. It was all part of a big network. It started with some of these senatorial families kicking them off their land, other senatorial families scrimping them of every coin they'd ever earned in their lives, and then others processing them into slavery so they'd go back and work on the fields that were once theirs. And this is the so-called undying love for the Roman people of Brutus on full display. While the cruel and tyrannical Caesar banned the practice of indentured servitude, put a limit on how much rent you could charge, put a limit on how much interest you could charge, cancelled a quarter of the city's debt, gave the people in the slums a year's free rent so they could pay back their remaining debt. And this is the one that really ticked them off. This is the one why he died, really. It was because he started a buyback scheme for the land that the senators had stolen over the last few hundred years and in doing so broke the true cardinal sin of Western civilization, the one that all these niceties and pleasantries throughout history are always trying to hide, and that is, thou shall not defy the banks. Now I want you to look at this classic painting of Caesar's assassination. How noble these slum lords and loan sharks are portrayed. The light of God guiding their daggers because of how justified they were in murdering Caesar. And I know at this point everybody in the audience is always thinking, wow, Jordan has become so devoid of content since the election. that he's now saying, man, fuck the ancient Liberal Party. <laughs> but 
but it's important. It is. This story is a real life Da Vinci Code. This is why you think the way you think. There is a lot of conditioning in this tale. Take even the phrase, benevolent dictator. Have you ever heard it said without snark? Why is that? It's bred into our bones that it's an impossibility that anyone who ever holds the title of dictator could ever use it to benefit the public. Well, it happened. And how different history might have been had he succeeded. I used to think the phrase, the pen is mightier than the sword, was a cop-out. But now I realise it's because the sword can only kill you once. The pen can kill you over and over again. The justification for why changing with each passing zeitgeist's proclivities to match it exactly. That is exactly why that man's spirit can't be laid to rest. He must be brought up from the dead every generation and murdered in a different way. It is for the exact reason that I was enamoured with Rome as a boy. It's because Rome exists somewhere in that ethereal realm between reality and myth. That is exactly where the subconscious likes to play. And what a better archetype villain than to get one of the few true people's champions of history to twist that story of hope and turn it into one of cynicism so that it's bred into the plebeian class's minds that anyone who's promising anything like Caesar must be lying. They're a charlatan a demagogue, a populist, just like Caesar was. That's why you had to learn about him in Year 10 English or off one of those Year 8 worksheets that made you think more than anything else. Fuck, I'm in a public school. <laughs> now, I also had to add this in. Because I got these snarky reviews saying, oh, he's comparing himself to Caesar. I'm not comparing myself to one of the most brilliant generals in history. You know he's still studied in military academies today? Generals are still scratching their... He was waving around a sword. They just said, how the fuck did he do it? They don't know. <laughs> to this day, he was a brilliant politician, dynamo with the ladies. James Bond isn't all that, let alone me, who interviews prime ministers with his fly down. <laughs> But I do pride myself on this. I would have been in that man's army. Either that or I would have died in one of Cicero's apartments before I had the chance. <laughs> but let's just say as a modern day pole bearer of the popularis, I remember putting that book down and thinking, damn, Paul Keating's quote is so much more deep rooted than I gave it credit for. Have you heard him say this? The longer you stick around in Parliament, the more you realise you're just having the same fucking argument over and over again. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? You know what else is astonishing? Paulie from Fat Pizza said the same thing to me. Because <laughs> I was doing Houses, an episode of it, and we are in between breaks, and he just gets down. I was doing my shoelace. He comes up. He's like, yeah, man, I'm a big fan of what you're doing. You really should look into ancient Rome. They're doing exactly the same thing now. Anyway, I'm going to hit you with this thong. <laughs> Every Paul in this country is a genius. Especially Paul Murray. But it was also strangely comforting to learn that much like Rome's pottery, her politics is set. You know why Caesar was seen as such a brilliant debater? I think it's incredible. It's because he actually used facts. Power had been so concentrated by such an elite class for so long that the senatorial debates just this endless private school back and forth. What do you think freedom is? What do you think liberty is? And then Caesar rocked up and said, I don't give a fuck what you think freedom and liberty is. You were paid to build a sewer. Where is it? It was revolutionary back then. Apparently like it is today. Because you know that I've been doing this job for nearly 10 years. Oh, actually, actually, I've just passed it over 10 years now. And in that entire time, I've never had a single substantive article written about me in the mainstream press, 
not once. Never substantively addressing anything that I've ever said. It is the same pattern that if you go back and you look at the Optimates arguing with the Populares, the Populares would bring up something substantive and then the Optimates had nothing because they were obviously just protecting these tiny little interest groups and so all they do is just resort to character assassination. Endless character assassination based off whatever the manufactured morality of the day is, always was, always will be. Genocide and everything. <laughs> I'm saying that these men might have died with enough money to erect giant marble statues of themselves. But you know something? The people used to spit at those statues' feet. When the Gracchi brothers were murdered a hundred years before for trying to enact similar reforms to Caesar, and the Senate threatened violence against anyone who even remembered their names. In spite of that, the people cobbled what little money they had together and they built statues of their own where at their feet lay the first fruits of every season for centuries because they tried to give the people their farmland back. When Sulla's men entered the city, the people manned the walls and threw rocks and bricks at his men. When Caesar entered, he was welcomed in a triumph. When Caesar was murdered, the people in a sorrowful rage, they stormed the Senate, the courts, every rotten institution they could. They stripped them of their wood and built Caesar a funeral pyre so high it could be seen from the city walls. And as his body burned his men, overwhelmed with grief, they ripped the badges that Caesar had awarded them off their chests. These were the most valuable items they had. And they threw them in the fire. The women... These were poor women, they didn't have money. They took off the only jewellery they had and they threw it in the fire as well. And you know why they did that? How sweet is this? They wanted to make sure that he had all the money he needed in his next life. It's a tale as old as Rome. If you side with the merchants, the bankers, the landlords, you're going to die an old man, you'll be buried inside a giant mausoleum, and history will record that you had earned it because of how pious you were, but the words will be as empty as your tomb. If you side with the people, you'll meet an early death, your grave will be dirt, the first layer physical, God knows how many metaphorical will fall throughout the ages, but you know something else, atop your grave will lay flowers. People still lay flowers at Caesar's grave today because of what that man did. And well deserved. When I first read about that, because I've been reading so much about him, I got a lump in my throat. And I wanted to pay my respects as well, so I just went online. I just asked anyone that I've ever known, really, do you live in Rome now or are you going to visit there? Isn't this amazing? I got one response. It was from the first producer I ever had at Friendly Geordies. She said... I'm moving to Rome next week. It was in the middle of COVID. Here she is laying the flowers at Caesar's grave. And there... <laughs> ...is the last Von Dutch reference of the show. I knew you were denied the crown when you were alive, Caesar, but I think it's well overdue. That's Alicia, everybody. That is the first producer I ever had at Friendly Geordies. Don't tell me history doesn't repeat itself. While I Imperator, thank you for trying. Here's to three years of labour. I'll see you next time, guys. Thank you.